one of the things patients like yourself, when they get in here and often ask me, or patients that have been on buprenorphine type of medication, Suboxone, whatever it is, is they always ask me, hey doc, uh, does this stuff do anything for mood? And uh, more often than not, it's because their mood is better and they feel better. And so really the quite, and I got some questions on YouTube as well. And this question really boils down to, is there, or rather, what is the connection within, with Suboxone and buprenorphine products and depression? Or ask more broadly, what is the connection between buprenorphine and mood regulation? This is a great question. And I'm always hesitant to give my thought or response on this in a clinical setting because somebody might think uh, I'm uh, off my rockers. Let me uh, do this. I'm going to answer this question in two different ways. One, what the research and uh, clinical evidence-based data shows. And two, what does my clinical experience show about this medication? And uh, I'll finish it off with some kind of overarching thoughts on the power of this medication, buprenorphine. So I went back and uh, because I get this question so often and some time back as I started to gain more and more experience with Suboxone and substance abuse in pain patients, I already clinically had a feeling about its value and power in mood regulation. And uh, sure enough, there's uh, quite a bit of data and evidence that's sort of gathering to support and validate this position. And uh, the one paper I particularly looked at, or a couple of them, I looked at about five of them uh, to see what was most recent. There's a paper in 2018, and there's a paper in 2019 that I looked at. And these papers are sort of like meta papers, and here's what they do. Uh, there's a chain of evidence when you do research of what kind of evidence you collect. And on top of that hierarchy in clinical evidence are these papers that look at a whole bunch of different studies that were trying to answer the same question. And they put all of that data together and they kind of churn out and spit out a statistical analysis of that data, which is really complicated to do. You need to be very skilled to do that and then they come up with the conclusion, okay? It's called a meta-analysis is one of the terms they use for it. So I looked at a couple of these in 2018 and 2019, and I had looked at them several years before, and sure enough, uh, it seems to be some really, really strong evidence to support the facts that Suboxone or Buprenorphine have a lot of efficacy and potential value for depression. One of the papers specifically looked, the, I believe the 2018 paper, looked at, uh, they broke it up into a few categories and they looked at depression, they looked at treatment resistant depression, they also looked at suicidal behavior, and they also looked at people that were harming themselves without an intent to suicide. And in all of these categories and areas, it seemed that Suboxone or Buprenorphine had a really profound effect on how these people felt. This is really important. If you look at the data on depression, it's not just somebody's feeling crappy. The World Health Organization estimates about 300 million people a year suffer from depression. In the US, uh, I think uh, the numbers a couple of years ago were about 50,000 suicides. About half of those are suffering from a major depressive order, plus or minus the data. You can't be 100% certain, but quite a bit of what they call morbidity and mortality, that means disease and death, is secondary to the prevalence of depression and the fact that it's not fully treated to the point where you have remission of the disease. In fact, most of the medications that we have out there for depression, very few people achieve full remission of their disease state. The data differs on this, it depends who's doing it, but some say up to 33% of the patients do not respond at all to the medication. So when you look at all these different groups of depression, uh, all these papers sort of found 
that at a low dose, a medication like Suboxone can have a profound, statistically meaningful impact on depression. Let me give you my, and again, a lot, every one of these papers ends with a lot more data needs to be gathered <clears throat> because, you know, you have sort of the pie. Now you have to slice it up and look inside. What's the dose of the buprenorphine? Does it matter if it's buprenorphine with naloxone? Does it matter if they have other comorbid conditions? Females, males, the young, elderly. Is there substance abuse involved? So there's a lot of research to be done, but I think uh, there is quite a bit of support here. Now this doesn't mean that if you're depressed, you should go start taking Suboxone. We're nowhere near coming to that conclusion and we have a lot of research to do. But for someone like me, who's prescribing this medication almost daily and has given out thousands of doses, I have a particular clinical insight to this and I'm very careful not to kind of share that with patients. One of the things that I've noticed, now let me put one small category out. There is a small category of patients that will kind of say to you, I just don't feel right and I don't feel the same as myself with Suboxone. It actually numbs me. And I take that at face value and I respect that <clears throat> and I work with them to get them off of this medication. But for the large segment of this population, what I do see is quite a bit of mood elevation and normalization. This is very interesting because it's very difficult to discern all of the confounding factors in a patient presenting with heroin abuse, let's say. And, you know, you could have all kinds of things and it all kind of gets wrapped up into one. You have adverse childhood events. You might have some sort of a genetic predisposition. You have adult events that could be PTSD. You have anxiety, you, have, uh, uh, you might have bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, and then you get this all wrapped up into one and you don't know, you know what started first, one of the psychiatric or mood disorders or whether the substance abuse came first. But you do notice this, and this really speaks to uh, pause, you know, as you can post acute withdrawal syndrome. When you get them off the Suboxone, a lot of the reasons and at times for relapse down the line, you start to see that if you were going to kind of pick one thing, it might be that mood dysregul dysregulation and the decreased mood that really causes that relapse, or at least it's an important component of it. So you have all of these things that kind of get meshed up into one thing, and you start to notice that mood dysregulation is a large part of that, and it seems to me on case after case after case that Suboxone and Buprenorphine not just help with elevation of mood, but sometimes they seem to help with the anxiety, and I don't mean in that in the short term, I'm talking in the long term where you're not going through acute withdrawals where you could chalk it off to anxiety. But in the long term, they appear to help with anxiety, they appear to help with sleep regulation, and they also appear to help with depressed mood. These studies even looked at, uh, as I said, major depressive disorder that was resistant to the traditional first-line treatments out there. And that tells you a lot. We do know that the opioid system within the body is connected to the limbic system and has a lot to do with emotions and mood. We do know that the opioid system within your body is sort of disseminated through multiple systems, everything from the gastrointestinal tract uh, to the upper motor, I'm sorry, to the upper cortex neurons that have to do with mood, they have to do with emotions. So it's widely spread out through what's called the central and peripheral nervous system and very connected to mood regulation. It's very difficult to tell what comes first, but I can say 100% for sure that a large percentage of patients, this really regulates their mood in a positive way. And at that point, you kind of start to wonder what were the reasons for the chronic relapses.
this really gives you a lot of food for thought. And when you think about what depression is, the sort of cost, you know, people think, again, there's 300 million people worldwide suffering from depression. The impact on work productivity, crime, and suicide is in the billions at this point. There has been a major increase from some data looked at from the early 2000s to today, how much depression has increased, and it's significant with a significant expense to the individual, the families, and our society. And it's very possible that in the near future, at the right dose, a drug like Suboxone, which is so stigmatized nowadays, might not only be used for medication-assisted treatment and maintenance for, the, for opioid addiction, uh, and second, hopefully we see more and more of this, it's used for many chronic pain conditions, but it's very possible you might start to see it for something like treatment-resistant depression at low doses tolerated well. And this brings us to one more thing. I often tell colleagues and patients that this is a powerful medication that its potential hasn't even been discovered or utilized to its maximal limit yet. And so much of that has to do with the stigma of this drug. Once we sort of get over the stigma of this drug and the issue of the addict, uh, I believe that we are really opening a can here that is extremely therapeutic and beneficial for many kinds of pain, including things like somatic pain, neuropathic pain, and we're just discovering the pathways that this stuff hits. We can deal, obviously, with substance abuse and addiction, and now we're talking about depression and mood regulation. If you would like the content of this video and you want to see related videos, go ahead and press the link above to my left. If you would like to see other videos in the future, we'd really appreciate if you press the subscribe button and press the bell. We have a lot of contents coming out around this topic in addition to other substance abuse. Have a wonderful day and thank you again.